Dr. Mini, we're set. Yes. Um, yes, can you stop sharing, Bulis, so Dr. Mini can start the session? Yes. Floor is yours, Dr. Mini. Uh, welcome to the finance sessions uh, of the ERF's 27th online conference. Uh, hope to have an offline conference come next year. We do have one, four wonderful papers, and we have our wonderful discussant, Dr. Samir Ghazwani. Uh, we are going to start with the first two papers, which is present, which is on oil monarchy, oil monarchies, and bank concentration evidence through the 2008 global financial crisis by uh, Dr. Sudi and Malik. And then we will have Survival of the Fittest, a natural experiment from crypto exchanges by professors Isan Khan, Topaz, and Tunala. And then we will give a break. Uh, we will, I'm sorry, we will go into the discussion of those two papers, have Q&A, and then go on to the other two papers. So let us start. Dr. Houdi and Dr. Malik, please. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Sam Hoody. I'm relatively new to the ERF community, but just quickly saying hello to you all. Um, I think Adil's about to log in. So, oh no, he is here. Welcome Adil. I think he's a, as an attendee, so I don't know if you can do your magic to make him a panelist or whatnot, but I'll go ahead and share my screen and then you can tell me if that works. And uh, it's full screen. Is that working? Yes, perfect. Brilliant. Um, so I'll just start and just basically talk at you for a few minutes um, and then we can move on as, as Mini um, introduced. So um, my name is Sam Hoody. I am new to the ERF community. I um, had the pleasure of studying uh, at Oxford last year with Adil. Um, Adil was my supervisor while I was at the University of Oxford at Royal College. I was studying for a degree in uh, development economics in which we did it thesis together. Um, Adil is an associate professor um, at the University of Oxford. I'm sure you're all uh, familiar with his work. He's on the line at, at the minute. Um, maybe he wants to introduce himself, maybe not. Um, but essentially, yeah, I'll, I'll go through the slides and then um, we can take questions at the end. So the paper we're working on, or the paper that I'm presenting on, is on oil monarchies and bank concentration, uh, evidence from the 2008 financial crisis. I think firstly we'll start off with what bank concentration is. Uh, so there are many uh, economies and financial systems in which assets are concentrated in a handful of banks. Um, for example, in Angola or Qatar, you have 80% of assets that are owned by three banks, um, but this can be as low as 30% in the US or India. So the three largest banks will only own about 30% of assets. Um, and this metric is popularly captured uh, through the measure of bank concentration. Um, in this paper, as you can probably tell by the name, um, we're interested in what could explain this variation, so we explore two main dimensions, uh, namely politics and oil wealth. Um, before we begin, it's probably um, worth noting why, why the focus on bank concentration at all. Um, so bank concentration is interesting in that it acts as an intermediate um, determinant of financial sector outcomes. So it could determine things like banking sector efficiency or financial stability. Um, there's been a lot of research so far um, on the politics of finance, um, but this is usually focused mainly on sort of the broader dimensions so on financial access or broader financial sector development um, there's been relatively limited research on how the politics of finance affects the organization of of a country's financial sector so things like um, bank concentration now um, an important point to make is that bank concentration does vary and it varies in quite interesting ways uh, so the first graph we have on the left compares democracies and autocracies and you can see on average auto autocratic countries have higher uh, bank concentration than their, than their de democratic counterparts. Um, and then looking at oil wealth, you can see all rich countries have on average much higher um, levels of bank concentration um, than those that are oil poor. So we're interested in these two dimensions. Um, and you can probably tell that the disparity isn't as big when you compare democracies and autocracies. And that introduces another dimension which we're interested in, which is the temporal capacity. So looking at bank concentration across time, again, we've stratified by democracies and autocracies here. Um, you can see that there's a convergence towards the end of our sample period. 
um, so around 2017, autocracies and democracies um, have similar levels of bank concentration. And this might explain why in the previous slide, the disparity isn't as, as big. But if you look at um, sort of around the early 2000s, you see um, autocracies on average have, have, have much higher levels of, of bank concentration. So maybe zooming out a bit and kind of looking at the conceptual uh, framework of, of, of the research, why would we expect political institutions or oil wealth to determine um, bank concentration? Well, as we've just seen, um, autocracies tend to have a higher um, share of uh, a higher level of bank concentration, and this is owed to potentially a higher share of state-owned banks. Um, the financial sector can act as, as quite an important and useful uh, lever for overall political control. Um, and as, as, as suggested in the name, we also explore variation within autocracies. So um, different types of autocracies, um, considering different regime types. Um, and this is not entirely dissimilar to the other aspect of, of what we're looking at, the oil wealth dimension. Um, <clears throat> There's a tendency for oil rich countries to have higher bank concentration. We speculate that this is because this is driven by the need to hedge against extreme volatility. So you can imagine um, a commodity dependent economy um, would be susceptible to price changes. So you'd want to have a consolidated financial sector that can kind of absorb these shocks with sort of a higher capital base or high capital buffer ratios. Um, and then again, we, we also notice that a lot of oil rich countries actually tend to be autocratic polities with quite high redistributive demands. Um, and, you know, popular research kind of corroborates, uh, corroborates this. I'll briefly talk about the data that we use. So bank concentration, um, we have both three and five asset um, bank concentration ratios. So this would be the percentage of assets that are owned by either the three and fifth largest banks. Um, we use a sample period from 1997 to 2015. Um, and this is quite nice because it captures things like M&A activity or failing banks um, and whatnot. For our independent variables, we mainly use um, political data sets and data on terms of trade volatility. So our political data set comes from Barbara Geddes, um, who compiles a really useful um, data set for regime type classification. So we look at democracies, monarchies, military party and personalist regimes. Um, and then we have a bunch of natural uh, resource wealth indicators. So looking at resource rent as a percentage of GDP, um, natural capital per capita. Our preferred measure is um, capturing natural resource induced volatility. And this comes from terms of trade volatility data, um, which essentially um, tracks high frequency commodity, commodity based terms of trade um, changes, um, I think dating back towards the 1980s. And we also have a host of control variables. I'm not going to go through these here um, and kind of not to spoil, spoil the surprise, but our results kind of do hold up against the menu of these control variables. Um, <clears throat> and then maybe as a starter for 10, uh, we introduce a, a first set of cross-sectional results. Um, and this makes the emphatic point that volatility is a more important determinant of bank concentration in autocracy specifically. Um, so this is just a basic um, cross-sectional regression with bank concentration as the dependent variable. Uh, you can see um, our, two, our four regressions control for GDP, population, natural resource, and natural resource wealth. Um, and interestingly for us, terms of trade volatility is significant in only the autocratic country sample. So I'm looking at sort of columns three and three and four here, and that's for both three asset and five asset bank concentration ratios. So this kind of sets us up to think: What is it about autocracies that mean that they can or have to achieve higher levels of bank concentration? So to kind of broadly de detail how, how the paper's structured, so we've just seen that terms of trade volatility matters a bit more um, for autocracies. So we explore this um, in a dynamic setting using a system GMM model, and we find that over time, terms of trade volatility drives higher bank concentration in autocracies. Um, to explore this further, we use a difference in differences research uh, design um, to explain the significant divergence in bank concentration following uh, 2008. Uh, this divergence is overwhelmingly uh, driven by monarchies, um, and we offer a political economy explanation as to why monarchies have and are able to achieve higher levels of bank concentration. So we'll dive straight into the dynamic panel analysis. Um, as I said, we employ the system GMM uh, estimator. Bank concentration is our dependent variable. Um, GMM is nice because it allows us to capture quite persistent um, independent variables. So bank concentration is quite persistent, so um, we can sort of um, capture, ca capture lags um, to get more interesting analysis. What we're really interested in is gamma subscript two, so the coefficient on the interaction term. 
Um, the interaction term here is a binary non-democracy indicator um, attached to terms of trade volatility. So essentially, we want to study the impact of a non-democratic country with terms of trade volatility um, and assess its impact on bank concentration. Um, so the interaction term essentially allows us to capture this interaction between um, oil and politics. So our, our first initial estimates come through, um, and I'd like to direct your attention to columns two and four. So you can see the interaction term on ND, so the binary non-democracy indicator in terms of trade volatility, um, are statistically significant. Um, and we split across two samples. So we have an all country sample and a developing country sample. Uh, the interaction term is of higher um, magnitude in the developing country sample, um, albeit at lower significance. Um, but it does give us enough impetus to kind of um, explore this interaction between oil and politics um, in, in, in our analysis. So now, in terms of looking at the, we, we're, we're trying to capture these sort of um, effects um, and try to do so in a sort of see whether this is time invariant. So to do this initially, we plot terms of trade volatility and stratify by democracies and non-democracies. And you can see an overwhelming jump in terms of trade volatility um, following 2007, um, nicely timed with the global financial crisis. So essentially we want to know whether this impact, the, um, the sort of interaction term that we saw in the previous slide, whether that is non-linear or time invariant. Um, so to do that, we split we split the sample again um, to, into pre and post 2008 levels. So you can see the interaction term in column two is statistically significant with a 0.578 coefficient. Um, and this tells us that um, it is this interaction, the, the, the interaction term is driving results um, post 2008. Um, so it's quite interesting that we've captured a sort of non-linear impact um, of, of this interaction term. Um, and briefly, um, column three is just using an extended data set, mainly for robustness measures. Um, but essentially, we've, we've, we've found quite a nonlinear impact in that this interaction of oil and politics is really taking effect um, after 2008. So now we move on to the difference and differences um, analysis. So this is quite an interesting plot uh, where we just plot bank concentration across time. Here we highlight monarchies in, in particular um, due to this divergence. So you can see we have democracies in blue, non-monarchy autocracies, so that will um, encompass everything like from personalist party, military regimes, um, and monarchies at, at the top. And the divergence is quite stark. So if you go back to this graph, if you were to stratify by more regime types, um, monarchies are overwhelmingly um, at, 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 at the top. It essentially looks like, like the non-democracy non, non uh, line there. Um, so the difference in differences um, is used the, using the, the specification at the bottom. So we have bank concentration as the outcome. Uh, and in this delta subscript post, that's just a binary indicator for pre and post um, 2008. Um, and monarchy, again, another binary indicator um, if, 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 if the regime is a monarchy at the time. Um, and again, we're, inter we're interested in the interaction term. So beta subscript one um, at the intersection of monarchy and um, post 2008 levels. And then we have a vector of characteristics that we control for um, ranging from everything from GDP to financial sector development, and then country and year fixed effects. Sam, excuse me for interrupting. You have four no. more minutes. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll hurry up then. Um, so. A quick word on the financial crisis, it's interesting that it can kind of shock the banking system primarily through policy responses, um, and this makes the institutional um, aspect um, quite interesting. Um, we estimate a flexible specification plot to just see whether there's differential trends um, before 2007 and find that there's overwhelming significance um, following the crisis. Um, and then we'll move on. Um, so again, uh, the results here are quite stark. So you can see, um, comparing columns two and four, um, the interaction term nearly doubles in significance when we restrict to autocratic regimes um, and is quite statistically significant um, at the interaction. So our main takeaways are that in monarchies, bank concentration increased post-2008 relative to non-monarchies. Um, and this divergence is more pronounced when we restrict analysis to an autocracy only sample. But we also wanna know what, to what extent this might be driven by oil wealth. Um, so again, we look at a plot for monarchies, oil-rich non-monarchies, and oil-poor non-monarchies. And we can see that 
although um, oil rich countries tend to have higher bank concentration on average, um, monarchies overwhelmingly have higher bank concentration than their oil rich uh, counterparts. So this gives us impetus to consider that there is also an oil wealth uh, effect. So here we control for oil rich. So that's using a binary indicator for countries that get either 10 or 30 percent um, more of their uh, resource rents from oil related activity. Um, and I'll direct your attention to column five, uh, the interaction term on monarchy and post. Um, it's quite statistically significant, even when we are controlling for oil rich. So, th so this tells us that there is um, an oil wealth effect uh, worth capturing, um, in addition to, to the monarchy effect. Two and more can... minutes, please. Two more minutes. Sure, sure, sure. Um, and then we consider some mechanism analysis as well. Um, but this is sort of based on patchy data. Um, so probably worth glossing over uh, at the moment. Um, so yeah, just to sort of round up on the monarchy effect, um, monarchies we find are generally more open to the outside world. Uh, they have high levels of financial and trade openness, um, but in, in wanting to maintain control of the financial system, but also remain open, monarchies manage to manipulate bank concentration. And this is known as the openness control trade-off uh, in the paper. Um, Largely oil rentiers, the oil effect posited at the beginning of the presentation does form part of our, our explanation. So in terms of just wrapping up um, what we've already heard, so following 2008, um, bank concentration does converge across regime types after 2008. Um, and this is likely explained by a powerful combination of oil and politics, um, bank concentration being used as a lever uh, by monarchies to kind of maintain closed polities um, and pursue their development agenda. In terms of next steps for the research, we kind of want to pursue this using more detailed data sets. So considering things like exchange rate mechanisms, uh, whether a country's had an IMF program or not before. We can also instrument for monarchy status and oil wealth. Um, there's, this, there's data on like distance from Bombay and capturing uh, resource wealth, which could be quite interesting to capture um, monarchies or, or oil wealth. Um, and there's an interesting case of Nepal, which had a regime change, which consider the collapse of the monarchy um, so we can kind of use a synthetic control method to kind of manufacture um, what would have happened if Nepal uh, maintained the monarchy status. Um, and thank you for listening. Thank you for being on time and for a no, very good okay. presentation. Thank you, Sam. I urge the uh, listeners and readers to read the paper. It's really a fine paper. We have a really a group of excellent papers in this session. Uh, and thank you, Sam. Thank you very uh, I'm much. sorry I switched the order of papers. Ahmed's paper was actually the first one, the one on Bitcoin, the famous Bitcoin. So uh, why don't we go ahead and start yours? You have 15 minutes, Ahmed. Thank you. Thank you, Ojam. It's great to see you all. Uh, and thank you very much for the kind invitation. Hopefully soon uh, we will meet in person after yes. COVID-19. We all miss to be together. And again, thank you uh, for ERF. Thank you. Uh, Mino Jam uh, for chairing the session. Uh, my paper is a bit uh, actually uh, not very technical paper. It is more of a thought uh, process. I have been working on the cryptocurrencies uh, market for about four years. I was working for the central bank and especially after I left the central bank, I thought in order to understand the conventional economics more, probably we should look at the some extremes. Uh, and definitely cryptocurrencies are one of the extreme. It, it constitutes relatively still the marginal uh, proportion of the financial market, but it tells us a lot about the conventional markets. For example, in order to understand the nature of the financial markets, nature of the ma money uh, uh, the, the, as a fiction, uh, I believe Bitcoin is, is a good channel to start. I mean, we always teach uh, the money is like medium of exchange, store of value, unit of account. But more importantly, the money is the trust, trust institution. And oftentimes we, we used to be thinking mostly that this, this trust is provided by the states. Uh, once the states back up the fiat currency, then that uh, currency become more valuable or less valuable depending on the credibility of the country. So I believe even for inflation studies, for monetary policy studies and so on, uh, it is good to understand the cryptocurrencies market, how it functions because it provides us a very good natural experiment environment. Uh, because in reality, we cannot get rid of the states. I mean, we cannot just try it for a couple of days. Let's have a stateless environment and let's see how things are running. We cannot do this and have an experiment. But 
we can experiment this through cryptocurrencies market because in the cryptocurrency market we don't have any single government uh, there is lack of there is no regulation at all in most of the cryptocurrencies uh, that's why over the last four years i mean my interest uh, in understanding cryptocurrencies is actually not just to understand and invest and to be rich through <laughs> through cryptocurrencies but it is even more than that it is more uh, deeper than that, uh, even to understand the functions of the state, I believe cryptocurrencies are providing lots of opportunities. And one of the related issue is actually uh, is in this paper. Uh, there is another strength of literature. It is more of a policy making literature, but I do remember this for the last 10, 15 years. Many of the exchanges are in jeopardy. I mean, they are they are in a sense they are feeling some danger because in the past there were lo local uh, stock exchanges and anyway the people are not going out and investing in other uh, stock markets it was not that digital anyway so the local uh, exchanges of the conventional asset used to be traded mostly in the local market and there is relatively less integration uh, among the global markets even there is an integration but it was not that quick uh, but right now, most of the exchanges are feeling the danger that uh, many of their enlisted companies can be enlisted in, in just one uh, stock market. For example, if you put all, all of the emerging market countries, major uh, listed companies into London Stock ex Exchange, nothing will change I mean, because everything is uh, done online anyway. Uh, so especially in emerging markets, especially in smaller markets, they are feeling the danger. For example, I know it from the uh, Bosnian uh, stock market. Uh, I guess 50% or, or some proportion of it is anyway owned by the Turkish Istanbul Stock Exchange because the market is so small. There are relatively very few number of firms. This country is small anyway. And also the stock market, uh, in the stock market, there are relatively few firms operating. But still, we have uh, a stock market in Bosnia. Why? Because it is kind of a national sovereignty that each and every nation state should have their uh, financial markets. And one of the indicators of this financial market is to have an independent sovereign uh, stock market. But this is not very efficient because there is not enough liquidity. It might be better for the uh, Bosnian uh, stock market to be up to be operated in London or in New York, in some other places, or it is even operated 24 hours, seven days. It is now possible. It is not just from nine to five uh, daily or from 10 to five, 10 to four. Uh, in a digital environment, we are not obliged to abide with the, some of the former regulations. So that idea that this paper comes from such an idea because we cannot have an experiment of closing down some uh, small exchanges and integrate, that, integrate them into larger exchanges. We cannot do this because of many national sovereignty uh, issues from nationalistic perspective and so on. But in the cryptocurrency exchange, there is no state. And uh, when you have your cryptocurrency, you can exchange this in different uh, exchanges. It could be Binance, it could be uh, coin markets, it could be uh, some other exchanges. There is no limitation that you can only operate within your uh, country. That's why we thought that this is quite a good natural experiment uh, to analyze if, what if uh, we don't have this national borders, if we don't have some internal regulations forcing the firms to just uh, uh, to be listed in their national boundaries, what is going to happen if we have multiplicity of exchanges? Uh, are some of the exchanges uh, surviving better than the others? So that's why we put the name as the survival of the fittest. Uh, so this is that's why I'm econometrically we have Professor Shevket here. Uh, I will not claim anything about the strength of the econometrics at all. But uh, in terms of the idea, we believe that it is quite an interesting one. Uh, so uh, let me stop my presentation I will, and I will try to keep it short because I, I pretty much give the general idea of what we are trying to do. And econometrics is relatively simple anyway. Uh, but, but before that, let me also 
state why this is important and how, why we should approach this cryptocurrencies exchanges, our cryptocurrency market overall, not just uh, kind of an, one of the asset classes. I mean, it is right now becoming more and more important for sure, but it is a different game in the town. Uh, we are uh, we are born into a new life, new uh, financial market. So, and how do we see this? Definitely, we see this in the exchanges, in the crypto exchanges, as I have mentioned. But even we see this in the non fungible tokens. For example, this one is a, a famous piece by Banksy. Uh, it is an art work uh, but recently this becomes another art firm form uh, some uh, some people has burned this uh, uh, picture and then record this and sell this as a non-fungible token and it was about uh, three hundred eighty thousand uh, dollar uh, but this is turned into a non-fungible token so this is important another example is the Jack Dorsey Jack Dorsey has sell has sold the uh, first uh, ever tweet that he sent, and it was two point nine million dollar. Oh. Why I'm saying this? This is not. This is nothing to do with the paper, uh, but as an, just to understand. I mean, it's a new world, uh, and there is a new alternative financing or financial system is emerging. Even the, for example, in this paper, we wrote this paper relatively just before the COVID-19 crisis, and we didn't include the time period uh, after COVID-19, just to really uh, analyze the survival of the fittest, whether the Binance as an exchange is the survival of the fittest or not, without taking into account the COVID-19 crisis. But even after that, we have decentralized finance, DeFi. Even that, we don't need to have exchanges. I mean, we wrote this paper for exchanges to show that cryptocurrency exchanges might be superior than the conventional exchanges because i mean they they don't they do not have to operate within the borders they are more universal but even they go one step further instead of having this sort of centralized exchanges because still this uh, the binance for example is a centralized okay, exchange five more minutes five more minutes i, I will yeah thank you minojam i will cut it short uh, but still, even uh, in the last one year or so, we see the emergence of decentralized finance. And in there, we don't have even centralized exchanges. So it's a totally new world. So we have to be aligned for it. And this non-fungible tokens person, it's a quite an interesting. But let me uh, move to the papers uh, for the entire time. But I will keep it very short because I know I give the main message anyway. In this paper, we explore the applicability of the universal cryptocurrency exchange by analyzing four different cryptocurrency cryptocurrencies. We, these are the exchanges: Binance, Laco, uh, Latoken, uh, KuCoin, and uh, Quash. But uh, this is the, they have the exchanges, but they have also their utility tokens. When you exchange in these uh, places, you can get a discount if you use their own. Uh, utility tokens. For example, when you use Binance, you get certain amount of discount depending on the volume. And even when you refer the people, you can get some other discounts as well. So that's why we approach the survival of the fittest idea by analyzing their prices because this is an indication. It's kind of a proxy uh, how uh, the this uh, currencies will survive over time. So we analyze the Binance and we need to have kind of an experiment and uh, in 2018, China has banned the exchanges. So this exchanges has to move to other places. And Binance is one of the leading cryptocurrency exchange. By the way, that's why, I mean, this paper is not completely econometric paper because this is more hindsight from the market is even more important here. We know that Binance is a leading uh, exchange in the cryptocurrency market for sure. But why they are uh, leading exchange? We try to address this in this uh, paper. When this sort of regulatory actions took place in 2018, they immediately, just in one uh, week time or so, they moved to Malta. And they are not actually moving. You know, it's a digital market anyway. They just have their leg legal entity in Malta, but probably they are still operating from China or from East Asia. Uh, but still, this is, this is a good signal. I mean, there are exchanges, they are competing. They are competing against regulations. And some of the exchanges are even acting proactively and they're moving to other places. And definitely Binance 
is uh, in uh, also in our economic results is the uh, survey of survival of the fittest. So the idea again, uh, I mean, the 2008 crisis is uh, quite important, and uh, this uh, led to some of the exchanges even to be questioned more. I mean, if you follow many of the conventional exchanges right now, they are trying to be like uh, data providers. They are not just uh, exchanges. Exchanges getting commissions for one percent, two percent, because the even the commission rates are have declined radically because if you impose too much uh, commissions, the firms might be enlisted in other places or there are other type of ETFs can be uh, generated. So that's why in terms of the commission market, the exchanges are having difficulty. Uh, that's why uh, we believe that uh, cryptocurrency exchanges is also providing a good platform because they have relatively lower commissions and there is much fierce competition among them. So uh, the main purpose of this paper is to present an empirical evidence for the possibility of having a universal stock exchange instead of having national stock exchanges. But is it possible to have a universal stock exchange? Ahmed, uh, one more minute. Sure. One more uh, minute. OK, uh, the uh, borderless <laughs> status uh, cryptocurrency exchanges provides for this. I, I explained this. There, is some, all of this. there are already some existing papers on this, but we believe that First of all, the cryptocurrency market exchange is a good platform to analyze the conventional implications. And also this 2018 movement of or ban of the exchanges in China. And as a result, the movement of Binance to Malta is a quite a good national experiment. And then from there, we cite some articles in the literature, uh, which uh, there are relatively few papers, by the way, because it's quite difficult to test this. I mean, there are argumentations uh, there are some regulatory papers. There are lots of discussions. I, I know uh, from the policy making space, I mean, uh, the exchange, uh, conventional exchange uh, CEOs and so on, they are quite concerned. They, they want it to be competitive uh, against digitalization and they still want to keep their commissions. But there are relatively few papers because it is difficult to uh, prove that it is better to have one universal exchange and to have lower commissions and it will be, the market will be deeper, it will be more liquid and so on. There are, most of them are more uh, uh, policy discussions. And in this paper- okay. You're yeah. out of time, but I'll give you two minutes from my discussion okay. time. So two more minutes okay. and then wrap it up. Thank you, Oja. Uh, and we, we got the data from coin, coinmarkets.com. Uh, and we get, again, we don't get the volumes of this uh, crypto exchanges. We have another idea actually. I mean, we are working on it. We got the volumes, and it, and it is quite difficult sometimes to get the data in cryptocurrency market. We have to write our own codes to get the volumes, and we are working on that paper as well. But in this paper, we just look at the prices of these exchanges, uh, and definitely, as you see, Binance is leading, especially after 2018. Binance becomes more trustable, and we stopped in 2019, just before uh, COVID-19 crisis, because after COVID-19, another story comes up, and we run Johansson co-integration model and recursive Johansson integration just to see whether the Binance disassociates itself from the other uh, cryptocurrencies. Our results are as expected. Uh, Binance uh, predominantly uh, disassociates itself from the other exchanges, from KuCoin, Cash, and Lakot Latokon. La, La token uh, after it move, uh, it is moved to Malta. Uh, and also we discuss in the paper what might be the other reasons, the security properties of the Binance, the proactiveness of the CEO. We discuss this. All those issues are definitely influential. But at the end, it shows that Binance uh, positively uh, disassociates itself from the other cryptocurrencies under this regulatory environment by proactively acting and uh, becoming the dominant player in the market. And right now, Binance is even more dominant in the market, even after uh, COVID-19. And uh, it, for the future, we know that, I mean, this is not very strong paper econometrically, but this is what we can do with existing data. Again, we are looking at the volume data uh, of the uh, crypto exchanges, but our overall message, uh, we are at the beginning of a new research uh, Area. I mean, this is this topics will be discussed more. Even, for example, last week, what happened? You see, 
the China start imposing some regulations. The uh, Bitcoin has declined to twenty eight thousand dollars. So all this regulatory environment, the new alternative form of financing, uh, decentralized financing are emerging. And there are lots of topics to be discussed for the finance and economics people. And we hope that uh, this paper could be one of the good actions uh, for even for further studies uh, to understand the uh, alternative markets, but having implications for the conventional exchanges as well. Uh, Mino Jam, thank you very much for, uh, for sharing and for a, allowing for me a to very go good further. presentation. Very good presentation. And Shirin, thank you for keeping the chat up. Uh, we have these two papers that I'm going to discuss. I'm not going to read uh, the comments in um, to preserve time or to keep time for the questions from the audience. These two papers could be sessions of their own. And in fact, in the future, maybe we should have sessions just on the topics themselves. Uh, wonderful papers. And uh, I have uh, six minutes now, so Sam and Ahmed, feel free to cut me off anytime just to be fair. Uh, let me start with the first paper again. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Uh, the authors probably already have it. The first paper is a, a paper on bank concentration, single commodity exports, monarchies and monopoly market power during and after the 2008 financial crisis. It's a paper that combines political uh, political institutions, natural resources, and terms of trade volatility for countries. The authors use a difference in difference analysis and also examine differences in bank concentration between the monarchies and versus others. There's a very good literature survey. I, I urge the audience to read it. They look at the definitions that come from political science on five different regime types. These are democracy, monarchy, military, party, and personalists. They use an annual measure of commodity terms of trade volatility, and they test the hypotheses that terms of trade volatility causes changes in bank concentration, among others. It's very well written, but my points as a discussant is always from the point of the reader. What questions come to mind when I read a very good paper? And these are very good papers. So the reader would like to know the following. Using this Geddes classification of regime types from political science, is that a good substitute for institutions that we use in economics? I think somewhere along the line, paper needs to, to address this. Number two, I would love to see a list of the Middle East countries, Middle East North African countries to see which brackets do they fall. And in, among these five that I listed, in fact, I, I was even curious about the United Kingdom. Is the United Kingdom a democracy or a monarchy? Where does it fall? So a table in the appendix which shows Sam as to, uh, and, uh, uh, as to where countries are classified would help. I'd love to see where Turkey, where I come from, is also classified. I won't comment anymore on that one. All right, and then volatility of terms of trade me, depends on the country's export por portfolio. Are most of the monarchies correlated with one single export, such as natural resources? So that again, you know, a sentence on that in the paper would be very good. Uh, all in all, it's a very interesting paper that merges a political science brackets or bracketization of uh, monarch countries with economics. Very good paper. I urge the uh, readers to read it. Thank you. Now the second paper, Bitcoin, as well as altcoins and exchanges. I live in Chicago, even though with all the hurricanes and everything else, electricity is on and off these days, where Chicago Mercantile Exchange and the Board of Trade are the lifelines of this, of this city. So exchanges are important. I know federal reserves as well as central banks have been looking into digital currencies for that for some time. And in fact, they have now started calling them not currencies, but assets, digital assets. So this paper again, looks at a very important part of which one is a good currency exchange. 
because the way it is on digital currencies now, all the risk is on the buyer. It's not necessarily on the exchange itself in, a, in terms of settling trades. The exception is the Binance, which actually, once there was fraud, actually came up and um, reimbursed the buyers for the first time. So that gave it a credibility in game theory that the others do not have. So it's a very, very important, uh, very important topic. By the time, by the way, after I wrote this in May, the uh, I found out this paper has already been published a couple of months ago. So con congratulations. Uh, so most of my comments are now irrelevant because it's a published paper, but I still would like to talk about it. Uh, we're talking here on um, four coins. Uh, the largest are. Uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Binance, and then Dogecoin. And a good crypto exchange is essential to somebody who wants to buy into it or to not, or to sell it. So does that, does that exist? That's what this paper is exactly about. The four exchanges are Latoken in Mo Moscow, Binance that Professor Isan talked about, uh, Qcoin in Seychelles and Cash in uh, regulated in Japan. Binance is now, as of this writing, is in Malta and probably in Singapore. Um, and another well-known exchange is Coinbase, which is very popular in the US, which has the coin. So in the paper, I kept looking at coin to see how that relates it. So in your future papers, I think you should mention something about the coin. Very good uh, start in the paper, uh, leading edge. Uh, the paper talks about crypto tokens and crypto coins. Those are a little bit different concepts. So the paper needs to address that issue as to the difference and why they're talking about tokens, but using the data on coins. Uh, survival of the fittest is true among these four that uh, Binance is the best because when there was fraud, they did uh, compensate, the, excuse me, the holders of the coins. Uh, being an economist, we love to look at the financial structure of the countries, which Professor Isan talked about. Uh, Malta is now thinking of regulating uh, this one. So where can Binance move to? Very flexible, uh, very, maybe in their next paper, look at this universal exchange and where it could be, uh, be placed because all countries are trying to get to uh, regulate these. They're scared of something happening, you know, with a loss of assets. So um, I think uh, it's, it, it's a very good paper. It's already been published in very recently. So congratulations and an important point paper. Uh, all the central banks that I know of and uh, exchanges are looking into these uh, digital assets. My executive MBA students are purchasing them like crazy. They bought it at 60, that's a Bitcoin, 60K, and now it's around 40, but that's the volatility of the market. Great paper, both of them great. Thank you very much. Uh, for those listeners who have questions, please put them into the chat. And for uh, Professor Sam and Ahmed, please look at the chat. And when at the very end, you have to answer back, you will, you will have time. Answer also the questions put up by the audience. Thank you so much. We're going to go on to the next paper. Mini, Mini, there's yes. one, um, there's Dr. Mahmoud Haddad who's got his hand raised. So if we may, uh, um, if we may listen to what he'd like to bring to the discussion. All right, can we listen to Mahmoud? Can we please listen to you? Mahmoud, you're able to join us. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, 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 yes. yes. Good morning to you, colleagues, Mina. I see also, I think that will be Shaukat. Uh, uh, good morning to everybody. And, uh, thank you, thank you Mahmoud. Uh, thank you very much. And I, you know, they are very interesting papers, but I got uh, two, I don't wanna uh, talk a lot about this. They are very interesting and I'm interested very much in these areas. Uh, for Sam, uh, what tools did you use? I've uh, just a uh, couple things. What tools did you use to measure concentration? There are many different tools 
to measure concentration banks, and there are some of the positives and negatives of every tool to measure that. Uh, my question from the finance point of view, as, as I, we concentrate on finance, are these mergers and acquisitions and concentrations, are they due to country characteristics in terms of political characteristics or probably country size, oil, or are they due to economic factors and the value of the entity itself? Uh, would we see mergers and acquisition in the United States? I don't want to ask more than these two questions or at least two, these two points. And then for cryptocurrency, congratulations on the acceptance of the paper. I think that Mina raised a very, uh, very important question about risk in uh, cryptocurrency. And I'm very interested in cryptocurrency and the digitalization of the uh, financial market in general. But when we saw about the risk only on the buyer, in every other exchange we talk about, and we come in about another market that's going to be an alternative uh, to the exchange which we talk about, who are the middlemen? Usually in the exchange, doesn't matter what exchange, the liability comes into somebody. In this case, there's no liability. Second, who owns the asset? Whose liability and who owns the asset in this? And for, you know, in, in the stock market, there's a buyer and seller, and there is the uh, a company that guarantee that the exchange will be completed. We know there's a lot of people who have lost tons of money in the cryptocurrency without being having any liability on the exchange. I think these are two uh, risk and uh, liability asset is very important. And when we talk about the last point I would like to make, when we talk about uh, a global uh, exchange market, uh, we see a global organization such as the World Trade Organization, and that's international. We see NAFTA, we see European Union, we see the GCC, we see the Tiger country. And all of these are unfortunately, whether due to politics, or due to other factor, they have not been stable or successful, which we'd like to see in the financial market. I do thank you, I really enjoyed it, and I'll be still with you guys. Thank you, Mahmoud. Uh, uh, Sam and Ahmed, please do answer uh, Professor Haddad uh, when your turn, turn comes. We do have two more papers that I want to make sure we present, and then we'll have time for uh, answering these questions. Thank you very much, Professor Haddad. We're now going to go to the next paper by Samar uh, Abdul Majid. I do not. Is Samar on? Let's yes. see. Hello. Okay, good. The paper is Financial Integration and Stability During Crisis, and you have 15 minutes. Please start. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity um, to present my small research paper. And uh, I'm sure that I will benefit from the feedback uh, that I will get from such an expert group of uh, attendees and discussants. Um, so let me share the screen. So can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, perfect. So my paper is uh, on financial integration, inclusion, and stability during crises, insights from the Middle East and North Africa or the MENA region. So uh, in this quick presentation, I'm going to give a, a, a brief overview or an introduction about the topic of the paper, and then I'm going to give a, a summary of the literature review um, and the methodology I used or relied on in my analysis. Then I will present quickly the, the um, most important results I got from, um, from the analysis of the data, and then I will end up with the conclusion and the policy implications. Uh, so despite of the widely accepted claims that financial markets play a key role in economic growth, it has been argued that finance hasn't been uh, or hasn't benefited the developing countries or economies as expected. And the link between financial development and economic growth, poverty reduction, and income inequality hasn't been clear or empirically, empirically robust. Additionally, uh, the increasing trends of liberalization and openness of uh, financial markets didn't lead to increased levels of financial inclusion or stability in a region like the MENA region. Uh, moreover, uh, concentrating on the MENA region, few studies have uh, addressed financial markets uh, in the Arab world and the MENA region. 
Therefore, the aim of this research is, is to study the relationship between financial integration, inclusion, and stability within MENA. And this is, to my knowledge, the first study that examines the interrelationships between the three variables here, integration, stability, and inclusion, in the financial markets of the MENA region. The paper would help uh, understand the benefits and integration on increasing or decreasing inclusion in a region that suffers from the lowest inclusion measures uh, worldwide. Furthermore, the study aims to explore the role of inclusion, if any, in promoting financial stability within the MENA region. Uh, accordingly, the study here attempts to answer four main questions. The first question is about integration. So uh, in this paper, um, I try to see whether financial markets in the MENA region are regionally integrated or not. And then I will examine uh, how do crises affect integration in the region and how are financial integration, inclusion and stability uh, linked together in the MENA region? And finally, what's the role of other important factors, financial development, got these interlinkages? Uh, a quick overview about the, the literature. So it's still underdeveloped when it comes to the MENA region or the financial markets in MENA. This is on international I'm not sure, but I think we lost the speaker. Yes, we did. <laughs> yeah, they must be having thunderstorms over there too. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Why don't we do this? Sorry, I, I got disconnected. Oh. <laughs> oh, okay. I there you go. go ahead, Sam uh, Samar. Go ahead. Okay, you so okay. share screen, right? Yeah, I'm yeah, sure. It now. Share screen again. Good. So, uh, can you tell me which slide you were able to uh, to see, or which part you yeah, were able to hear? We can see it all right now. We are at literature review, but you can you can progress. So, okay. uh, you can go to the next slide. Okay. We saw this one. Um, so about the relationship between integration, stability, and inclusion, um, studies have referred to the benefits of regional financial integration uh, on promoting stability on the long run uh, compared to international or global financial integration. On the other hand, the literature hasn't uh, extensively investigated the linkages between financial inclusion and stability. Uh, furthermore, previous research has shown that the relationship between financial stability and inclusion is not unidirectional. So there are some feedbacks and uh, mutual effects between financial instability and inclusion. And therefore, more research is needed to delve deeply on, into the relationship between financial inclusion and stability, especially in the emerging economies, including the MENA region. Uh, so the methodology of this paper focuses on um, uh, countries in the MENA region, including 13 Arab countries in addition to Turkey. And uh, the paper here focuses on the two main financial uh, sectors uh, or financial segments, which are the stock markets and the banking sector. Uh, and to measure regional integration, the study here depends on calculating the correlations between the stock market uh, daily returns and constructing an index of regional integration based on these uh, correlation coefficients during the period of study, which ranges from 1998 to 2018. And this will be the measure uh, which will uh, be used later on in the model to assess regional integration within uh, MENA region or between the MENA uh, region countries. And then in the next step, the study will explore the relationship between financial integration, inclusion, and stability using the panel vector autoregression model. Uh, so the main three endogenous variables employed in the model uh, include the financial integration, regional and international, inclusion, and stability. 
As for the, the variables which is used by the study in analysis uh, for integration, as mentioned before, uh, the study depends on constructing an index based on the correlation coefficients between the stock markets uh, as an indicator on regional integration. And then uh, for, um, for assessing international integration, the paper uses two measures. One is a detour measure, which is one of the uh, widely used detour measures of, uh, of international financial integration, which is the Chin A2K Open Index. And the other one is the de facto measure of integration. And uh, the measure which is used here is the percentage of net foreign assets to GDP, which is one of the uh, used um, indicators of financial integration in the literature. Uh, as for financial inclusion, uh, there is a cons uh, constraints, some constraints on the lack of data uh, uh, regarding financial inclusion. Uh, there are many measures or many indicators used in the literature to, uh, to refer to or to assess financial inclusion. And here I used the, the most complete data which are available for the, uh, the MENA countries under study here. And this measure is the bank deposits to GDP. And this is one of the indicators again used by the literature to measure financial inclusion. Uh, moving on to financial stability, the indicator used to assess financial stability here is the bank Z-score indicator. Uh, in the model also, the study tests other, other endogenous variables, which uh, as mentioned before, include financial development and governance. Financial development is, is measured uh, by the stock market capitalization to GDP, which is again one of the uh, used indicators by the literature to assess financial development. And for the governance indicators, the World Bank set of, of governance indicators are used in analysis. Uh, finally, uh, to estimate the impacts of the crises, uh, which are here, there are two crises of interest to the study, the global financial crisis and the Arab uprisings. Uh, one of them is the financial crisis and the other one is the political crisis. So to examine the impacts of these crises on the integration, inclusion and stability of financial markets in MENA, uh, two dummy variables are used to represent these two crises. Now, moving on to the analysis and the results, um, to, um, uh, the first step, as mentioned, is to assess the regional integration um, uh, within the MENA region. Uh, and to better assess the co-movements between stock markets, the study here tried to employ the dynamic correlation coefficient Garsh models, which are better to assess the dynamic correlations among stock markets. Uh, results based on the DCC Garsh models showed significant dynamic correlations between the stock markets of Egypt and each of Lebanon, uh, Morocco, Oman, and Saudi Arabia. The Turkish market also exhibited a particular correlation uh, with the GCC markets, and the uh, analysis showed an increase in the dynamic correlations over time between Qatar and Saudi Arabia and Turkey and the UAE in particular. Uh, also, uh, the analysis showed that there are peaks in dynamic correlations which are observed during the global financial crisis. And this reflects uh, the increase in key movements between markets during crises. Uh, Autoregression model, uh, which uh, is uh, built mainly using the three endogenous variables, uh, integration, inclusion, and stability, along with the uh, uh, for financial development and uh, for governance, and uh, the two dummy variables for assessing the impact of national integration uh, um, negatively affect both, both inclusion, inclusion and stability. International integration also leads to more regional integration uh, for the crisis. I think we lost her again. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there, I'm there sorry about that. No, that's all right. So are go ahead, please. <laughs> so I was um, I was discussing the results of of the panel uh, of our model. So um, I think I stopped.
uh, this, yes, share this again, slide. please. Yeah. Continue okay. that one. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the results of the panel VAR models um, show, show that global or international integration um, negatively affects both inclusion and stability. Uh, international integration uh, was shown to also lead to more uh, regional integration. Furthermore, the global financial crisis has led to higher levels of regional integration among uh, the MENA markets. And from the panel uh, vector autoregression models, uh, the impulse response functions estimated illustrate the, the negative short-term impact of global integration on inclusion and stability. So as mentioned, there, there are negative impacts of global integration on inclusion and stability. However, these negative impacts start to diminish on the longer run. On the other hand, global integration leads to positive short-term effect on regional integration. But as time passes, this effect turns into a negative one over the longer run. The results also refer to the positive impacts of regional integration on inclusion in, in the MENA region. So the model showed that regional integration has a positive impact on increasing financial inclusion. As for the regional integration results highlight the, the positive impacts of financial development, which is measured, as I mentioned before, in terms of the stock market capitalization to GDP, and the role of crises, both uh, the global financial crisis and the Arab uprisings in motivating regional integration among countries in many. The impulse response functions show that the positive impact uh, or show the positive impacts uh, of uh, regional integration on inclusion, which decrease uh, or tend to decrease over time. Uh, so to conclude, the paper here shows that uh, regional integration is still limited in, in, in MENA, despite of growing linkages with other international markets. And the regional integration uh, aspect in, in the MENA region is more pronounced among countries that lie within closer uh, geographical proximities. Uh, moreover, crises, whether being financial or political, also tend to affect uh, regional correlations and linkages between the financial markets in the MENA region. Although the impact of financial crises is higher compared to political instabilities, uh, the analysis also highlighted the positive short-term impacts of uh, regional integration on inclusion in the MENA region. Uh, however, these impacts couldn't be maintained for, for longer time periods. And in contrast, the international integration or the increase in international integration had negative impacts on inclusion and stability that diminish over time. Uh, the panel VAR model finally um, couldn't show any linkages between financial inclusion and financial stability in the MENA region. So uh, to conclude, it can be argued that global integration cannot be avoided. However, regional integration in light of the results might be part of the solution to mitigate the short-term negativities of instabilities and the crisis contagion from developed markets. Therefore, it's crucial to strike a balance between international and uh, regional integration in many financial markets. And uh, just to state some of the limitations of the study um, is the data availability, as mentioned before, which restricted the use of few indicators and uh, also the complexity of the three phenomena discussed by the paper, which are integration, inclusion, and stability. And each one of these includes so, uh, so many dimensions um, that uh, could be captured if the data allow for that. Um, so multiple aspects of these three phenomena could also be explored in the future, such as the financial inclusion of marginal groups, including the poor, youth, and women. Uh, and of course, this will be um, conditioned on the availability of data for uh, countries in the MENA region. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Samar. Thank you for, again, I urge the audience to read the paper. It's a very good paper and thank you for the presentation. We now go to the fourth paper, last but not least, by professors Haddad, Hamoude, Hakim, and Selmi on external debt and growth in highly leveraged MENA countries when interest rates are falling. They might be reversing, but that's another issue. Please, again, the, after we have the discussants for these last two papers, we will have the uh, presenters respond back to questions and to the discussants' comments. Thank you.
please go ahead. Okay, thank you, Mina. Uh, as, as, as my friend Mina mentioned, this research is in cooperation with Mahmoud Haddad, he's, who's with us, Sam Hakim and Rafq Salmi, I assume Rafq is with us too. And this research is about the relationship between external indebtedness and economic growth when interest rates are falling. And here we look at highly indebted Arab countries. Oh. Seem like I'm not sharing the whole screen. Oh, things went down here. That things have changed on me. I, uh, I can you see the yes, yes, I can. Yes, I can. Is is it a full screen? Uh yes, it I can see it. It's not full. You have to go. Go to the bottom the, to the right. The, the, the bottom has been taken by Okay, I'm moving up the pictures of the participants. Uh, okay, it's a full screen. Now well. it's full screen, yes. Uh, more than a full screen, I think. Okay, I wanted to go right to the motivation. And as some of our participants mentioned, we had two uh, grave global financial crises in the last two decades. Uh, the first one was a financial crisis. Uh, it damaged many economies in the world. And the second one was a health and an economic crisis. In those crises, uh, many people suffered. They affected their lives and lively, liveliness of, of uh, livelihoodness of these countries and the people and the businesses. And so government reacted to those crises and they embarked on uh, debt to improve the people's lives and, and businesses. And uh, the, the amount of the debt attracted the attention of many academics and even some policy makers in developing countries. So to give you to put things in perspective, I could say that developing countries accumulated $10 trillion in external debt during the COVID period versus $4.5 trillion in the global financial crisis in 2008-2009. So the amount of debt that had been borrowed was greater much greater, more than it was the amount that was borrowed during the global financial crisis. Uh, MENA is not an exception. Uh, the average public debt in the MENA countries grew by around 8%, rising from 46% of GDP in 2019 to 54% of GDP in 2021. So, so they borrowed this money to deal with the health and social crisis that their citizens suffered from. Uh, what helped them to borrow this huge amount, especially in the COVID period, was the decline in interest rates. And interest rates have been low since the global financial crisis. And in some countries, interest rates were negative. So that encouraged countries to borrow. And I don't know when they borrowed, they have a plan and how to spend the borrowed amount. Uh, the countries that we have in mind here in the Middle East, in the MENA region are six countries. And that was determined by the availability of the data. They include Bahrain, Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Morocco, and Tunisia. We could not find data on, for example, Algeria or Sudan. Uh, and I will talk more about it at the end. Uh, we, we are interested in this topic, motivated to work on this topic because uh, there, have been, there have been studies that showed that if, if debt to GDP ratio exceeds certain thresholds, you could cramp economic growth. So it's important to understand how countries spend their borrowed money. Uh, also, the, 
what give us motivation to do this work is that the literature is not consistent on the impact of debt on economic growth. Rahman uh, did a study on, on 30 articles and found that the relationship between debt and economic growth could be negative, could be positive, or could be irrelevant. So that give us room to look at those six Arab countries. Okay, here is here here some uh, some uh, pictures on the relationship between uh, debt to GDP ratio and, it can, and, and, and the amount that was borrowed. On the left hand side, you will see this is the debt to GDP ratio. And on the right hand side, you will see the interest rate. And you see this black dotted line shows that interest rates have been falling steadily most of the time. Uh, but if you look at the debt, external debt for these six countries, this, this gray curve represents the debt to GDP for Tunisia. Uh, this is like 100% here, 2019. And the second one, the blue line or the blue curve is for Jordan and is, is almost 80%. And then you have Morocco and the blue in the, in the yellow line and Egypt is in the orange line. So you will see that interest rates has been falling, uh, borrowed debt, borrowed amount, uh, the debt has been rising, especially since uh, this, this year around 2015. Uh, so what are our objectives? Our objectives is to examine the relationship between the external debt and economic growth by concentrating on the experiences of six highly indebted Arab countries. And I've mentioned those six countries. And uh, we are, the method we're using is, is the panel quantile regression, panel quantile regression. And we have included certain modification in this panel quantile method in studying this relationship that has not been studied in the literature on this topic. And then also we have included covariates uh, on economic growth. We have around six covariants that include in addition to debt to GDP ratio, we have included, uh, for example, gross capital formation, which has been used in previous studies in this relationship. We have also included uh, the, we just mentioned all of those six, six ones, included military spending, trade openness, global geopolitical risk, and global economic, economic policy uncertainty. Those are our covariates that we've used in the study. In addition to our main, uh, independent variable, which is the debt to GDP ratio. Uh, in terms of the literature review, uh, there has been no consensus on the relationship between debt and economic growth. And the, the studies that have been done uh, were done mostly before interest rates were falling. And I mentioned about Rahman study that reviewed 33 articles and found that the relationship was positive, was negative, and uh, irrelevant. So the literature first concentrated on the threshold, the threshold for the debt to GDP ratio, and they found different thresholds after that the debt to GDP ratio could be very damaging or could be very irrelevant. So the threshold, uh, the threshold ranged from 70% to 115% that for the GDP, for the debt to GDP ratio. So that was- You have five more minutes, five oh no. more minutes. Uh, and, then, and then 
Other ones looked at economic systems, uh, institution, and so on. Uh, uh, the research that have been, that have been used concentrated on linear, linear panel data models, but we introduced two mod modification in this approach. Uh, we used the panel uh, quantile, and we looked first at the heterogeneity, uh, and we we used the the, the Kanai fixed effects uh, estimator to deal with the heterogeneity. Uh, and the, the second modification that we use is about the endogeneity problem, because you run economic growth on GD, debt to GDP ratio, debt could be exact, could be endogenous. So we have to use the Kim molar test to look at the quantiles and distinguish the quantiles that have endogeneity problem from the ones that don't. And then we have to kind of repair the quantiles that have the endogeneity problem. Uh, here, you see that here plot A, is this is the linear. It looks at the mean, but in here you have three quantiles in here, but you have nine quantiles. And you see that this can take care of outliers and take care of heterogeneity, asymmetry, and so on. But these are the control values that I mentioned. I'm not gonna repeat them. The sample period is annual from 2006, 2019. Uh, and we, we looked at the, I think I, I see my thing is cut off because it's too, too large. I cannot see the title. Uh, so uh, the, 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 really, the conclusion, the conclusion, we found a negative relationship between economic growth and debt to GDP ratio only in the lower quantile. In other words, when you have downturns and you have crises, the relationship is negative. It's not significant in the upper quantile or in the middle quantile. So what does that mean to us? It means that those countries were not spending uh, the debt uh, on, on economic growth. They were spending it, for example, on putting food on the table for people and taking care of their uh, health uh, uh, lives. Uh, and then we, for the covariates, co we found that cross capital formation was significant in all quantiles and positive. Uh, for the other covariants, we find most of them were negative, especially I mean, uh, military spending, uh, geopolitical uh, risk. Uh, so what to do? So that means government should pay attention to how they spend they borrowed money during downturns and crisis. They should have more transparency and should have institutions that could guide these governments in how to borrow and how to spend the money in ways that will promote economic growth. As is the case with all studies, our study has limitations. We only have six countries. We don't have many countries and also we need to include more variables and so on. I think the paper lists all the limitations of the study. Thank you. Thank you, Shevket. Thank you for finishing on time and another solid paper. And uh, again, I urge the readers, these are really the cream of the crop, these four papers. It's, it's fascinating to read them. I'm now going to turn over the discussion to Professor Samir Ghazwani a good friend of mine who was an econometrician. And Samir, you have 10 minutes. Thank you, Amin. I'm happy to meet you, uh, even virtually. Uh, yeah, me too. I, I have some comments uh, about uh, on the, the two papers. The first one is uh, dedicated to the analysis of uh, the relationship that may, may exist between uh, financial integration, financial inclusion, and stability. Uh, in addition, the author uh, sheds some light on the impact and the role of crisis in these relationships, 
uh, and uh, the study was carried out on a panel of 14 MENA countries. Samir, yeah. excuse me for a minute. Shevket, could you please stop sharing screen? Oh, yeah. Thank you. All right. Sorry, Samir. Go ahead. So uh, from, from a methodological mm. point of view, we, we, we retain two steps. The first one permits to appreciate uh, the nature and the degree of integration of the stock markets in the region uh, by conducting an analysis of the correlations by means of uh, DCC GARSH models. And uh, the second step is uh, conceived to examine the relationships between the three components of the model uh, using panel var uh, models. So, uh, I find uh, the paper interesting and uh, it made it possible to obtain some results already uh, elaborated by other studies, but uh, with other methods of econometric analysis. We mainly retain the low degree of integration uh, of the MENA region stock markets, except perhaps for neighboring countries, for example, uh, GCC countries or Maghreb countries. Uh, we also observe that a political and especially financial crises have reinforced the interrelationships between the stock markets of uh, MENA countries. We have also observed the positive impact of uh, regional integration or inclusion, which is a promising issue, I think. So overall, uh, the paper is well written, especially the part uh, relating to uh, the theoretical background. There is a good presentation of the theoretic aspects, the definitions of the key variables of the model, as well as the mechanisms of interrelations between them. But uh, it's uh, the part dedicated to the presentation of the methodology, which uh, lacks precisions. I have some remarks to, to provide to the author. Uh, first of all, about the GARSH specification. Its adoption goes uh, through a specification test against an ARSH specification. And I don't know if uh, whether this test uh, was done or not. Uh, this test uh, of the Lagrange multiple uh, type makes it possible to validate uh, the, the two structures, if you want. Uh, a second point uh, concerns the determination of the optimal lag. What uh, we look at the paper, we, we, we see that the GARSH 1-1, with lags 1-1, the model was chosen, and we don't know if uh, uh, this is uh, done uh, through uh, the test uh, or mm -hmm. the choice of optimal likes. Why I, I, I speak about that? Because uh, a bad choice, if you want, of uh, an optimal like could uh, lead to fallacious results. Mm -hmm. so I don't know if the author, the author uh, has uh, conduct the, 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 the procedure to, to choose the, the optimal lag. Also, the same remark reappears with the panel var models, because uh, going through the results, we notice that it's a var with lag one. And here, uh, also, we don't know why and how uh, this uh, lag uh, was chosen. Uh, we know that it could be chosen normally by means of information criteria like uh, Akai or Schwartz uh, information criterion, for example. Uh, another point uh, concerns the construction of the dummy variable indicating the Arab uprisings. To me, uh, quite strong if we consider it for all the countries of the panel. Moreover, it does not provide significant coefficients in all the models, oh, and the effect is uh, uniform oh, over the entire you. panel. So this hypothesis, the fact uh, of, uh, of, uh, of construction. Shem, can, can you please mute yourself? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry, Samir. Go ahead. 
so, so uh, the problem to me is to, 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 to choose, to construct uh, this dummy variable uh, in putting uh, the event, but only for the countries uh, like Tunisia, Egypt, uh, uh, but not for the other, I believe. Uh, from the formal point of view, uh, comments based on the graphics are not very relevant. For example, how one can deduce from figure two the correlation of the stock market of Egypt with some uh, of the other countries in the panel. Reading the graphics is not really clear. No? We, don't, we don't understand uh, uh, whether what is written corresponds to uh, which uh, appear in the fields, especially figure two, uh, page uh, 12, 13. And finally, uh, I have a suggestion. It's preferable to reproduce the, table, the tables of the results in the body of the text instead of having them appear in bulk in the appendix. About the paper of uh, Mahmoud, Sam, Shaukat, uh, it renews an analysis of the relationship between external debt and growth in some MENA countries observed during the period 2006-2019. It differs really uh, from previous studies, either based on linear models or on nonlinear threshold models, uh, usually in, in panel context, since it develops here the a study using the quantile regression, quantile regression method. Here, the impact of debt on growth is not uniform uh, over the whole panel, but varies depending on the distribution of the dependent variable. We also find the same important results, mainly the fact that the high levels of indebtedness cause a reduction in growth. From this point of view, the paper is interesting and it made it possible to obtain some results already elaborated, elaborated by other studies, but uh, with another method of uh, econometric analysis. Uh, the paper is well written and well structured. Uh, we find a good and comprehensible uh, presentation of theoretic aspects in section two. Uh, next, the adopted econometric methodology and the, descriptive, the uh, uh, sorry, the description of the variables of the model are discussed in section three, and the last section is dedicated to empirical results. So, pay, uh, so the paper is coherent and uh, and well structured. I have only some remarks about uh, formal aspects. First question, the choice of a fixed effects specification is well presented in the, pa in, in the paper, but uh, the question, is there a specification test to, to validate it in the context of quantile regression? Uh, I had the question, but uh, I had the answer in the presentation today. Uh, why only six countries? So we understand now, uh, that the, there are the highly adapted ones in MENA region, but to, to, to gain in uh, statistical uh, performances of uh, the econometric results, maybe, I don't know, we can, we can uh, try or reconduct the empirical part with more than six countries. Uh, to guarantee uh, robustness of uh, the empirical results. About the time span, why we started uh, in the year 2006, why not before? Uh, another question on the empirical uh, results, are these empirical results robust to change in the quantiles, going, for example, from decides to quartiles? We can try this exercise. Uh, it's preferable to announce the statistics of the tests and their distributions, uh, these tests uh, which are announced in tables two, three, and four. And finally, uh, there are many references uh, seated in the text 
but don't appear in the bibliography at the end of uh, the paper. We, we have, you have to, to put them at the bottom of the paper. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Samir, for also finishing on time. I'm now going to give the authors the chance to reply back to both questions and to the uh, comments that we made. Uh, I'm sorry I reversed the first two papers, but we're going to go with the order of presentation. So Sam and Adil, I see Adil is also uh, in the audience. Uh, you have five minutes to answer back or discuss uh, your paper or dis discuss the comments. Thank you. You have the audience. Thank you very much. Um, I'll let Adil come in um, as and when. So I, I made a note of some of the questions. Um, I think the first one was, should we be using um, data sets like, like Getty's that kind of break down regime types um, categorically? Um, and is it sort of compatible with how it's um, establishedly used um, in, in economics? I would argue that it's not um, uh, normal for, for, for e economic studies, but I think that's kind of the beauty of it. Um, I think it does capture quite a few characteristics that would be lost if you had a sort of cardinal scale of zero to 10 on institutions. And just to briefly touch on Turkey. So Turkey would be classed as as, as a democracy un under Geddes. And I, I do agree that um, that classification gives, gives no indication of how well a democracy it is. Um, but we do also use in, in, in our analysis Polity IV data sets, um, which has a, a zero to 10 uh, rating scale on, on how institutions work. Um, and it corroborates the same stories that autocracies on general have higher levels of bank concentration. Um, but again, that, that, that categorization of, of, of autocracies allows us to get um, further nuance uh, in, in the studies. Um, and then I noticed something on how to measure bank concentration. Um, so we've kept it pretty basic in terms of uh, the number of assets owned by the biggest banks. Um, we initially looked at some indices that look at competition, um, but I think this, this muddied the waters a little bit. And as to whether um, M&As were due to economic characteristics um, or not, I think they are due to economic characteristics um, and banks sort of um, failing. Um, I think that's important to capture because if you sort of look at bank concentration increasing, um, you want to know whether that's due to um, concerted action by autocratic regimes or whether it's due to country characteristics. Um, so certainly refining that analysis um, by taking into account M&A activity or failing banks um, allows us to, to capture that. But I think I should give the floor to Adil who hasn't spoken sure. yet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, this is uh, it's, it's great to have Sam here in the ERF community. He's originally from Morocco, but based out of London. And I hope, Sam, you can continue to participate in our events. Um, very quickly, just to add on, on this sort of a distinction between military, personalist party and other regimes, um, there's a new class of political economy literature that's emphasizing the importance of varieties of authoritarianisms, right? And so the idea that you could really explore politics of finance by looking at a binary indicator, autocracy versus democracy, uh, it deceives the purpose. And that's why you see that bank concentration actually converges between democracies and, and, and autocracies. But within autocracies, monarchies stand out. And we believe that the monarchy uh, distinction is analytically meaningful uh, for the reason that Sam mentioned, which is to say that there's a lot of work from Jordan, from Morocco, from other Gulf economies, that monarchies ascribe a lot of importance to the financial sector, particularly the control of the financial sector. It's true in Morocco, it's true in Jordan, but particularly true also in oil-rich monarchies in the Gulf. Um, and the reason is that a lot of these monarchies uh, want to remain open to the outside world in terms of trade and finance. Nevertheless, they still want to retain their control of the financial sector. And how do you manage that? Well, if there are few banks uh, that control most of the assets, it's much easier. So there is a scale economy or scale political economy in, when it comes to the banking sector uh, uh, control. Now, an important aspect here is that a lot of these Gulf economies have very large projects, you know, huge infrastructure projects. Small banks will find it diff more difficult to finance them. Also, there is a lot of discretionary uh, control of the of, of the economy, right? Suddenly, projects are taken away or projects are cancelled, right? 
banks have to bear a lot of political risk. And so the idea also of mergers and acquisitions, I would correct Sam on that, actually is also very political. If you look at the public investment fund in Saudi Arabia today, it has bought major shares in big banks. And actually, Mohammed bin Salman's vision 2030 ascribes a hugely important role to the financial sector. And that's where larger banks that are well capitalized, better able to bear political shocks and better able to weather the shocks uh, induced by the by the f- global financial markets is is clearly helpful. Um, now, of course, uh, 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 country size, a whole range of other factors we've already controlled for in the analysis because we recognize the fact that there are certain countries that are smaller. You cannot support a very large, fragmented banking system. There ought to be just a few banks. Uh, those sorts of effects are already controlled for. Um, I'll leave it at there. Uh, your comment um, about uh, you know including a very clear description of how regimes are classified uh, and which uh, mana monarchies are part of it. I mean, th- this is very well taken. Basically, our monarchy effect is primarily mana effect, uh, which primarily consists of mana monarchies in the Gulf, which are generally oil rich, and uh, Morocco and Jordan on the side. Okay, so thank you very much, and we'll thank leave you. it. Thank you, Adila, and thank you for making that clear. A sentence added to the paper would make it easier for the reader. So that would be very good. Thank you very much. We now go to Professor Aysan for another uh, for five minutes for responding to the comments. Thank you. Thank you, Minoja. Uh, there are two questions uh, from Professor Hattat. Thank you for those questions. First is the risk part. Uh, it is on buyer uh, or not. Actually, these are at the end all centralized uh, exchanges. That is another challenge. That's why I wanted to emphasize this decentralized finance. When we wrote this paper, this decentralized this, this finance was not discussed much. But over the years, especially after COVID-19, we start observing more discussions on decentralized finance. Even there are special calls started to be coming up even in academia. In that, you don't have even a centralized uh, party to bring the seller and buyer. Uh, In the existing framework in the paper, uh, in the Binance and others, uh, the central party responsible for those transactions is Binance, but there is no guarantee that those exchanges will provide you if you make some losses, or there is no guarantee that these exchanges will not collapse. And it happened, by the way, at the beginning of the uh, Bitcoin, uh, some of the exchanges, they, they claim that they had cyber attacks, they lost, uh, cryptocurrencies have been stolen. And it is quite easy, by the way, to do so in this stateless environment, because in the state case, there is kind of a central clearing agency, you hold your uh, assets uh, in this uh, places, so uh, in the custodies, in the official custodies, but in this cryptocurrency exchanges, there is no such mechanism. They are trying to improve on it because they know that there is another challenge coming, which is this decentralized finance. But right now, there is still a risk that uh, this cryptocurrency exchanges might collapse. And that is the reason why this paper is also important because you really need to trust the exchange, otherwise, especially right now and Binance is a very huge exchange. Imagine what would happen. I mean, many of the people, even though they hold some of their uh, cryptocurrencies into their private wallets instead of in the exchanges, still there is a risk because you want to keep some of your money in these exchanges to be able to trade. For the larger investors, they generally do not keep their uh, cryptocurrencies in the exchanges because they have more to lose and uh, they generally keep in the wallets. And this is even a good indicator if people hold their money in, the, uh, in their private wallets, then it shows that it is, they are long-term investors. They are not going to immediately be cashing out their uh, cryptocurrencies. That's why there are lots of other research topics that might be interesting, but definitely this decentralized finance would even make this a kind of an absolute uh, kind of an exchange, uh, even for the crypto exchanges. Uh, the second question about the universal uh, exchange and the, relating it with IMF World Bank. Yes, there's a huge literature on how 
MF, World Bank, WTO, especially with this international coordination. But this is somewhat a bit different. In all those IMF, World Bank, WTO, there are states and they are competing and they are trying to collaborate. But in here, this is more of a market mechanism. Uh, the market participants, without having any states, they are coming and they are trying to form a universal uh, uh, exchange. Uh, so it's a more of a market-driven thing, but the IMF World Bank uh, sort of institutions are actually where the states are very much involved, one way or another. So that is a, that's why these cryptocurrencies are also quite interesting. I mean, is it possible to have a kind of a free market and the market institutions will form itself over time uh, due to repeated actions through credibility uh, enhancing mechanisms like the one that is explained in the paper. So that is also quite interesting. I mean, in order to understand this libertarian ideas, because you know, even when the Satoshi Nakamoto comes out in 2009, there's a very huge or very big ideological discourse. I mean, is it possible to be to have a, um, to have money uh, without uh, states. Uh, so this, these are quite libertarian ideas actually. And some of the players are quite libertarian. I mean, they involved in the market due to ideological reasons. Some others probably right now, the majority are uh, for uh, following after the uh, return. But that's why I believe it's quite an interesting uh, market to follow up. Thank you, uh, Oja for thank you very session. much and as a future paper too you know the coin is indexed to the us dollar so among these digital assets the ones who are free floating versus the ones who are indexed i mean i can just see Stay many well, things yeah. coming up thank exactly you very much. thank you thank you uh our next paper was with uh samar samar you have five minutes yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the comments and the feedback. Uh, so regarding the first question about the uh, Arch uh, LM, LM specification test. So the test was already done and it's mentioned in the paper that was uh, this test was conducted before est establishing the models um, of the Garsh 1-1. And the null hypothesis was rejected for all the daily returns. And that's why I went further on to to um, to estimate the model. So this test is already done and it's mentioned in the paper. Uh, as for the optimal lag, so for the Gosh 1-1, um, uh, this, this, this is like the simplest model that can be used. And this is one of the uh, most commonly used models because um, for higher lags of Gosh, it's going to be a little bit complicated and the data uh, will not um, like allow for a higher estimation or, or estimating higher lags for the Gosh model. Also, it, it's worth noting that even the Gosh 1-1 model did not converge for, for, um, for most of the data or for like uh, many of the data sets for, for the stock market indexes, um, uh, which I used in analysis. So the Gosh 1-1 model, is a, is one of the most commonly used uh, models in the literature due to its simplicity um, and uh, the higher lag models are a little bit more complicated and the data may not uh, or the availability of the data may not support estimating such higher lag models uh, for the panel var model again uh, um, due to the limitation of the data because my data set is from 1998 to 2018 and then it's for for 14 mena countries with lots of missing data. So I, I could not establish panel VAR models with the higher lags. So the data did not allow me to do so. So um, that's why I stick to lag one uh, due to the availability of the data or due to the number of uh, data points that I, I have in my model, which would not allow me to estimate higher lags for the panel VAR model. Um, as for for the dummy uh, for the dummy variable question or remark, uh, considering the dummy variable construction for uh, for estimating the the impact of the crisis, uh, thank you very much for this remark. And um, perhaps I I would I would uh, also uh, estimate this and try to um, uh, to incorporate it in the analysis in a different way or in a different kind of construction. 
And uh, uh, last for the, for the remark regarding the co dynamic correlation coefficients figure, which um, uh, which is a little bit visually uh, not very uh, very easy to 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 grasp because it's um, it's like um, um, a correlation coefficient for daily returns. So uh, what we can take from this uh, from from this figure is what we call the uh, volatility clustering, which is one of the phenomenon observed in financial markets where, uh, where um, higher correlations uh, or higher variability are followed by small variability in the next periods. And this is what we can observe or what we can take from this figure. Other than that, it's a little bit crowded because it's, uh, it's like estimating a correlation coefficient for each daily return. So that's why the, the figure is a little bit uh, crowded. So thank you very much for the comments, and I will uh, I will highly consider them in developing the paper and improving it more. Thank you. Thank you, Samar. Thank you very much. Last but not least, our last paper by uh, I don't know I, I see Mahmoud and Chef get there, so you have five minutes. Chef get unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. Uh, can can you see Rif Salmi here in the in the audience? Do you see? Rif? I don't see. No, I. He's don't not see. here. She's not here. Uh... He's not here. Okay, but I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna yield to you, Mahmoud, at the end. So if you want to say something, you can. I just want to thank the discussant for his positive words on the paper, and uh, uh, I want to stress that since we sent this paper to the ERF, we have had seven versions of this paper. So it has been revised seven times. And in this, in the, in the revisions, we tighten the, the areas where we need to explain further, such as why we have the data starting from 2006 to 2019, and it has to do with the availability of the data. We could not get data for before 2006 or after 2019. But as we said that in the limitations that this can be done and including the COVID period and see how this relationship changes. It's going to be two years before this COVID period is over. So it can be done over two years for that period. And uh, I think we mentioned all that in the paper. And uh, in terms of using fixed effects, the Kanai estimator, I, we have in another paper, we have used three fixed effect estimators. And we think that Kanai is the most promising and the most popular, but it doesn't hurt if we include the other two fixed effect estimators. We think that the, modif the economic modifications that we included in this paper that had to do with the fixed effects and the endogeneity problem will encourage other studies to do similar things or even improve on those things. Uh, and that's, that's basically the main contribution of the people in addition to the specificity of the six Arab countries. Why do we include that six Arab countries? Because this paper is written for the ERF. And we could have included <laughs> Turkey in this paper. Uh, we should have included Turkey in this paper. Uh, but we hope, we hope we include more papers once we get out of the ERF constraint to include people, countries and other places in the world. I think Mahmoud could have uh, two minutes, maybe. The quantiles, I think the quantile is the best scheme because most of the results have to do with the extreme quantiles. They were significant in the extreme quantiles. We have nine quantiles. Uh, Mahmoud, would you like to say something? Well, I, I, I do thank you for the, the, the nice presentation and taking the... Uh, lead to do that. Uh, it was, first of all, I would like to thank the ERF. I would like to, uh, to thank Sister Zahuda and Shireen. And Sister Mina, it's nice seeing you. And, and the people who are there, the colleagues like uh, Abdel Fattah, Abu Shukur, and everybody. And I would also like to thank all of those who allow us to listen to their uh, papers and uh, for the ERF for giving us the opportunity to always present our work and uh, to, to listen to uh, great uh, research on the Middle East. Uh, the, the paper really started when we start looking at it from the finance point of view, 
about what is the impact of negative interest rate in value, valuation. How could you use all these historical models in valuation when you have negative interest rate? All finance and all economic were built on positive interest rate time value of money. And now we witness in, in many countries when we talk about real rate of return is negative. How is that gonna change our way of thinking about what is finance? Uh, that, that where they, they started point, starting point and as uh, give a lot of credit to uh, Shaukat and to Rifk for their uh, hard work on this paper. Really they did uh, a lot of work because they are the econometricians and the economists. I am the person who really micromanage things. I do not macromanage and I'm not uh, good at micromanaging stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm good at micro rather than macro. And, and they are the people who have contributed a lot to that paper. But again, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And uh, hopefully I don't, uh, we don't have a lot of time because of time. I would like to thank everybody and nice seeing you all. I really enjoy seeing my colleagues and friends. Hopefully we'll be able to meet in person. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Mahmoud and Shevket, again for another very good policy oriented paper. And you know, right now the discussion is the, uh, not the negative interest rates currently, but how US can diminish their debt by devaluing the dollar. So the meaning, it becomes more meaningless. So I expect another good paper on from you, your group on how uh, US inflation will be basically uh, devaluing their <laughs> T-bonds that are all over the world. Thank you very I had, much. We, I had yesterday an interview uh, with one of the, uh, TV news about U.S. and the inflation and impact of inflation on U.S. economy and how it's going to affect consumer. So again, uh, yesterday was uh, was in the news, as a matter of fact. And I do thank you, Mina, for bringing this to our attention. That is that is correct, and it's it's a huge uh, issue, both with negative interest rates, which are now going to go into maybe positive. Who knows? They're watching for signals. Anyway. This was a very good panel for me. We have a couple of more minutes. So if you'd like to make comments on each other's papers or make additional yes. comments while we still have time, uh, please go ahead. Just Shevket, I see your hand, so go ahead, yes. go ahead. Yes, I just wanted to give an update on cryptocurrencies. Uh, mm -hmm. the, we've done research in cryptocurrencies for the last six years. We considered, considered Bitcoin as a safe haven, but mm -hmm. now things have changed in the last 12 months. Uh, Bitcoin has become a risk asset. It is risky and it's an asset, as Ahmed said. Uh, so in the last 12 months, Bitcoin has become as volatile as peso. Peso, which is the currency of Mexico. And if it is as volatile as peso, and peso is well known to be very volatile, it's not going to be a, well, a safe haven currency, and gold will stay as the gold standard for safe haven. That's an excellent point. Excellent. And I point. make another point on that, because that is another thing that I'm really interested in. You remember, Mina, last year that I'm supposed to talk about uh, digital money, and, yes. and yeah. I, I got sick, and unfortunately, I wasn't able to do anything. Uh, usually, we used to think about any currency or any other uh, asset, which we consider it as an asset, as it can be used either for investment, for uh, speculation, or for hedging. Mm -hmm. And if I look at the characteristics of any cryptocurrency or any currency, what is uh, what are the criteria needed to be for a currency to be considered currency? And many of these characteristics do not exist in uh, the current form, at least, of all the cryptos or digital currencies or digital assets, as a matter of fact, for that fact. And therefore, uh, up to this point, I think what we see, and this is why risk became a very high factor lately, uh, is due to the fact that only used most of the time for 50% of a usage of a cryptocurrency is for black market. That is a well-known fact. And because people try to avoid rules, regulation, government, and so on and so forth. And 
Uh, and therefore, the other are for speculation rather than really for an investment. I cannot use it to hedge. I cannot use it to reduce my risk. I cannot use it as a long-term investment because of its very high risk. And therefore, it's a speculative market where people trade. And so I was I wondering sometimes whether it's going to be an asset for investment or it's going to be a fade. It's, you know, like every other thing, like the sometimes we modif this uh, passed uh, out recently and i don't know if it's going to be like that I, again thank you very much but this is a couple thing about cryptocurrencies but Mahmoud, really excellent excellent point i i think digital assets are here to stay whether in their current form this is just like the beginning of the automobile market you know how that changed or the television market I think they're here to stay. More important is the blockchain technology, which is basically multi-party uh, approval of the blockchains and which uh, program or protocol you use for these. Uh, it's just fascinating. I mean, the topic keeps on giving and I really uh, encourage all of us to maybe have a session on uh, digital currencies come next year with uh, ERF. It's, it's a and I know, Shevket, the papers you presented in ERF, which had Bitcoin as part of the portfolio at the time and to see if it's a good hedging or not. And then Ahmed's paper on whether the exchange is solid. I mean, that's the crucial part. It's easy to buy. It's harder to sell. If there's fraud, what happens? What's the settlement? Who settles it? And right now, the risk has to is not shared yet, unless like Binance, which ba basically went and said, we'll cover the frauds. But how long can they do that is another question. This has just been a fascinating uh, panel. If there are no other questions, I'm going to close it by, first of all, thanking all of you, brilliant minds, really brilliant minds for your contribution, your time. It's good to see you. I hope to see you in person next year, but who knows? I also want to thank Shireen and Hoda. She was on for, for some time for the wonderful organization of getting us all over the world into these sessions and making a good job of it. Hopefully though, Shireen, for next year, we might have one where we see each other, <laughs> inshallah, where we see each other. Uh, all of you keep safe. I hope you all got vaccinated. <laughs> And I just I just want to thank you, Mine, as well for a fantastic job, always being there oh. for us, leading us, guiding us, and for a fantastic discussion. It's always a pleasure to see you all. Thank uh, you. Just being thank in you. person together, but hopefully next year, inshallah. And inshallah. Uh, Hoda will follow up with you with uh, the very kind discussions comments from uh, Dr. Mine and Dr. Samir. And um, we've got two more sessions for the conference tomorrow on the digital transformation and implications for growth, employment, poverty, and inequality in the Arab region uh, with Dr. Nabli and Dr. Shahrokh presenting us with the work we're doing with the UNDP on that front. Uh, you'll find that very exciting. And then finally, um, on Monday, uh, we'll have um, a session with Dr. Ranyan Mashot on uh, Egypt setting best practice with ODA. And finally, inshallah, again, you'll be hearing from Hoda very, very, very shortly, if you've not heard already, as we pull together the final session on the best papers on Wednesday, inshallah. And with that, I really wish you stay safe and thank each and every one of you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Safe, thank you. Stay, stay safe, everybody. Thank Good you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good to see you all. Thank you, Good John. to see you all. Bye-bye. <laughs>